in this section, we're going to again be talking about planning opportunities, talking specifically about holding companies, cross-border financing and IP and other techniques. But whereas the last session was all about what great opportunities we got here, we did delve in that, didn't we, into some of the caveats that we've been putting on that. We're just going to go into those a little bit more because realistically, to give any advice in this area, it's potentially a dangerous area if you don't appreciate the weaponry that different tax regimes and international organisations have to deploy against us if we're doing something that doesn't find favour. And I said this several times in the previous session, I'll repeat it again and probably several times tomorrow. Commerciality is the thing. If we are doing things which are commercially strong and which have a commercial sense and can actually be justified for commercial reasons, then that's good. And that means that almost certainly the tax structure will achieve its intended objective. Where that isn't the case, that's harder. And by the way, when I say commerciality, there's a difference, as we all know, between just being able to jot down a couple of things that are paper thin, wafer thin commercial justification and having a genuine commercial reason for it. But if you've got a good commercial reason for it, having a tax motive as well is absolutely fine. You don't have to organise your tax affairs so you pay more tax. And we touched on that earlier when we were talking about the definitions of avoidance and evasion. So, ah, sorry, uh, IT problems again. Let's see if this works. Hey. Um, so in this section, what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking about the concept of effective management and central management and control, where an entity is actually run from, where the decisions are made. Why is that significant? What's that relevant for? Thank you very much indeed, madam. It's the residency. It's where the company is resident. Most tax rules, are, do you remember on the, one of the very first slides I threw up, it said domicile. Um, don't be confused by that. There are different terms to which define the territoriality of any tax system. And generally, these talk about residents, some talk about domicile, some talk about, we used to have a concept of ordinary residents in the UK, which mercifully is now gone. Uh, but normally, residents or domicile are the two, term, uh, two terms that are used for corporates. Ultimately, the residents, which is the term we use in the UK, the residents of a company will be determined, among other factors, by where it is managed and controlled. And that's usually an overriding factor. So it may be registered in one jurisdiction, that's your starting point for residence. If it's actually managed and controlled somewhere else, then that will be different. We're going to talk about substance, um, which was a point that was raised by the lady on the second from back row, uh, which is very important. Where there isn't really any substance to an arrangement, it's probably going to be vulnerable to challenge. And we're going to talk about beneficial ownership. Slightly different context to the way I was talking about it before. I was actually talking about it in terms of could you look through to the beneficial ownership and tax the person with the beneficial ownership? Possibly. But there's another context to the term beneficial ownership, and it's this. If you have an entity that never has beneficial ownership of any money, it receives a dividend but never really beneficially owns it, there's a question about whether it's really a dividend. And if the withholding tax rate is zero on a dividend, was there ever really a dividend to that Dutch company? We'll talk about the, oops, we'll talk about the control foreign company rules, the CFC rules, not Chelsea Football Club or chlorofluorocarbon. CFC stands for uh, control foreign companies. In this context, it does stand for Chelsea Football Club and chlorofluorocarbon. But here I'm only talking about control foreign companies. We'll be touching on those rules and what the BEPS initiative is saying about strengthening those rules. We have to have one eye on that as well. How might that affect some of the things we're talking about? So there are opportunities, but there are complexities with this. And depending upon how we analyse any of these points concerning beneficial ownership, concerning the true substance of an arrangement, that will really impact, that will really decide how the withholding tax rates that we're hoping to get actually come out in real life. And we have to, while we're doing all of that, worry about the BEPS risks, what's changing under BEPS and what might happen as a result of BEPS and what countries are already doing as a result of BEPS and the anti-avoidance rules that countries already have and may have had for years and years in there. So we have to worry about quite a lot. So last session, 
It was dead easy, wasn't it? Let's get on to the guys at the back, set it with Dutch company, sorted. Um, we've got a low tax rate. This session is, slow down, guys. Um, we need to worry about all this stuff first. Yeah, everyone happy with that? Great. So here I just want to recap on the basic structure that we were talking about in the previous session. And we're just going to elaborate on this a little bit, but this is basically what we're talking about, remember? We're talking about a Saudi company that owns the whole of a US company, 100% of the shares, that's what it means. And you remember that if that's all we did, if we did nothing else, if all we did was to pay a dividend direct from the Saudi company, into, sorry, from the US company into the Saudi company, then we ended up with the 40% tax rate in the US, a withholding tax, tax in Saudi, giving us a horrible tax rate of 64%, and only 34 of every 100 that company owns ever coming into the hands of the Saudi company. Yep, everyone, everyone see that. That's the basic structure we we're talking about, okay? And we talked about an intermediate company, didn't we? And this produces a much better result. And you'll remember from the previous session, I know this is recapping, but it's important to do it because this will be some of the considerations that we're looking at in the case study. Remember that we looked at this and there were several things that we were relying on in order to get that much better result with this intermediate company. One was that we had a much lower withholding tax on the payment from the US to the Dutch company. Fantastic. Also, that we had a much lower rate, we had a, a low rate of withholding tax from the Dutch company paying to Saudi. So we've got two levels of withholding tax, but those two fives we established by common consensus, added up to 10, and we also established by common agreement that that 10 was lower than 30. Um, so you can see that's where the advantage comes from, from those low rates of withholding tax. Everybody happy with that? We have that little bonus in there as well for the Netherlands refunds that bit of tax. So that was how by using an intermediary company, an intermediate company, or intermediary company, I don't mind which, that was how we ended up, even though we're still just paying dividends, nothing deductible here, we still ended up with a better structure. Quick quiz for you. What are the key tax and financial considerations when setting up a holding company? Can everyone just chat among, can you just chat to each other and have a think about that? Then I'll be asking that question openly. Right, I have here the presenter's most powerful weapon, a flip chart. Um, and at this stage, I sometimes ask if anyone's brave enough to come out and write on the flip chart. I'm feeling kind today, so I'll save that till tomorrow um, when I'll be in a bad mood, no doubt. Um, so I'll write up these answers myself, but I'd like everyone to shout out anything that they've thought of just going through that thought process about what are the what are the key considerations. So it's just things you've got to worry about, things you've got to think about, things you've got to go away and check. What do we got? This will remain very blank unless somebody shouts out. <laughs> the residency of the company. Okay, great. Everyone happy about that? Oh god, that's a bit thin. Um, the uh, the residency of the companies is the answer, and you get some more thinking time while I get a pen that works. Um, so uh, the residency of the companies, um, dead right. Uh, we might decide that we want to set up in a particular place, but how do we actually where they're going to be resident? Okay, so absolutely fine. Is that what you mean by residency of the company? You mean where they're going to be resident? Okay, fantastic. Yeah, they're, absolutely. I guess. The question goes one stage further. I'm sorry, this is, can't fit in my question mark. The question goes one stage further, really. It's, it's um, what about the residency is going to be of importance? You're dead right, where they're where they going to be residents. So what about the residency and what are, what are the features that are going to be significant factors? Oh, uh, yes, yeah, substance of, uh, what, why are you doing it? And we've been over this lots of times, haven't we? We've mentioned this lots of times, so let's call it substance. Can you just tell me what you have in mind when you say substance? I know what I've got in mind, but you just can you can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Can you articulate that? Again, like if the company doesn't have enough substance in its own country, then other countries could challenge their presidents. Great. Yeah. Yeah, it's the difference between saying you're resident somewhere and actually the fact pointing you to being resident somewhere, isn't it? Yeah? Great. Okay. What else we got? Entity height. Uh, yeah, okay. 
Company other I've put there uh, because it could be a company, but it could be something else, couldn't it? So it could be the, and I'll actually write what you said, which is entity type. Oh dear, we are not going to have any luck today, I'm afraid. Uh. By the way, if anyone asks, can you tell them these different colours have great significance, okay? So they, re <laughs> they really mean something. And so that was brilliant how I explained that. That use of green and red and black. Whoa. Um, okay, so that says, excuse the multicolored stuff. Uh, company, other entities, what entity type? So other, other entity type, yeah. Keep them coming, guys. Cost Plenty more. So, cost involved. Cost, yeah, great. Okay, fantastic. This is great because none of these are on my list, so there's going to be a very long list in the end. Sorry, madam, yeah? Tax rate. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tax rate where? Just shout that a little louder, please. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so, well, I'll just put tax rate for the moment. Okay, keep them coming. Um, where do you actually operate? Where, where's the operating company? Or it's more than one. Okay. Right, okay. Okay. It said tax rate there. We've said several things about tax today, which isn't that surprising because it is a tax lecture. Uh, we've said several things about tax. What sort of taxes? Tax. Thank you very much. So I've got withholding tax rates. When we've decided where we're going to be, when we know where our top company is and where the operating companies are, then we can work out what withholding tax rates apply, can't we? Yeah? Where do you find withholding tax rates? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, if you don't learn anything about tax, it's been great comedy value. <laughs> so, where do, where do you find out about withholding tax rates? Thank you. Very good. And? Hey, uh, with uh, it, the local legislation, so the domestic legislation and the tax treaty as well. And you might even want to look in the multilateral instrument as well, just to make sure there isn't anything there that tells you you've overridden it. Uh, but no one does look in that at the moment, by the way. Can I point out? They should do. Uh, so it's basically the, the, the domestic rate, domestic and, and, um, and uh, the double tax treaty. So domestic. Ugh. Oops, sorry, long one. God, this is the messiest flip chart I've ever seen. Uh. Okay, what else we got? What are the considerations we got? Passive finance, GMP, or equity loans. Yep. Yeah. Oh, thank God. Okay, keep them coming. Anything else? Uh, so I think I heard something. Very good. By the way, I'll get someone to write this up so it's legible and, uh, and w one colour and then we'll get it sent off to everyone. Anything else? It's not a bad effort, guys. Anything else you want to add? Okay, th thank you. That's, that's, that's good. People are thinking about the right things and we're, getting in, we're moving in the right direction despite the, uh, despite the equipment uh, issues. Um, I'll tell you what... <sighs> I'll tell you some of the things that we had hey, on my list. There's more. There's more of things. But it's, it's, the point is, it's a big decision. It's a big decision. You're going to be setting up an operating company somewhere or you're setting up a holding company somewhere, whichever it is. So um, more likely you've got the business. You've got the business in the US, but you're wanting to work out where you're setting up a holding company, where you're going to pay dividends. There's lots of things that you really need to be thinking about. And um, we've had several of these. Look, CFC rules. Are there any CFC rules? Thank you very much indeed. Well done. Uh, what, what's the tax rates? What are the withholding taxes? Uh, we talked about checking the withholding tax in the double tax treaty. What am I assuming there? 
that there is a double tax treaty. And generally, countries that are quite good destinations for holding, com uh, holding companies tend to be ones with really good networks of tax treaties. Because, as you've seen, what, what, what doesn't a tax treaty do? <laughs> it doesn't tax you. What does a tax treaty do? Thank you very much. All, all in unison. I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you some music tomorrow, actually, and we'll sing that. Um, you think I'm joking, and I am. Um, so, um, so basically, you have to assume that you have to, if there is a tax treaty with a country, if a country's got a good network of tax treaties, that's probably good news because there's something that can relieve the tax rates. It's not necessarily good news, but it might be good news. It won't be bad news. Okay. Um, what about? There might be something else. There might be something there that actually means you've got a very good reason for putting it there because they give you a tax incentive. Do you remember with Holland giving you that tax credit, that two that came, it was only two out of three, still pretty good, still 66% of what you'd suffered in tax you got back from the Dutch authorities. There are other countries that will give you a tax incentive within the parameters of relevant international law, but within those within those restricting parameters, to the extent they do restrict, that is something it might do. Treaty network's a big one. Here's one we're not touched on. That company is going to be holding our company. What if we want to sell our company? Now, depending on where that is, there might be a big tax charge on that sale. And you have to think ahead to that, because if you are creating a real structure like that, and we know it's a real structure, why do we know it's a real structure? What has it got to have? Substance. It's got to have substance. It's got to have reality, hasn't it? So you can't have just set something up that you can just easily disband with no significance at all. You've got to have thought through these things. And that helps to prove the substance of the arrangement and means it's more likely to succeed. So, um, so um, th things like what would be the tax charge when you eventually come to sell it, uh, how transfer pricing rules, all these things are significant in this. There's the biggest one of the lot, which I'm glad to say somebody said, a second, which actually isn't on the, is it on there? It's not on there. It's why you're doing it. Why are you really doing it? And if you can't come up with any good answer apart from it saves a whole load of tax, if there is nothing else on your list, then the chances are you need to forget it. You need some reason for doing it that is non-tax. And that's a common theme through anything that I advise clients on to do in any jurisdiction in the world. You've got to have a commercial rationale for doing it. The good news is that there often are good commercial rationales. So for example, Holland has great expertise in finance companies. Now, that only really means anything to somebody when they actually do set up a finance company. Then they find out the treasury function there's brilliant, and they're earning a whole lot of money. And these are real considerations. And the access to that talent, the access to that expertise, the access to the banking systems that can support that are real reasons for having that kind of arrangement. You can go through a process, you will go through a process if you're setting up a company that's holding company for an entity where you're advising a client of comparing these things. So we did mention these, I can't read the green, comparing withholding taxes, for example. So you would look at the dividend rate of withholding tax if you are going to be paying, if you're going to be paying uh, interest, so you're going to be f uh, structuring it uh, with some of the capitalization is going to be by way of loan rather than just share capital, then you'd be looking at the withholding tax on the interest as well. Uh, the existence of CFC rules is going to be important because if there are CFC rules um, in that jurisdiction, then actually we might be shifting the entirety of our profit into possibly a higher tax jurisdiction when you look at the trading profit there. So how's that going to affect it? Now, it might be, in theory, the CFC rules in that other jurisdiction might not hurt us at all, but you need to know. So, you know, if you're going to set up a holding company for a UK operation, the UK rate of corporation tax will be only 17% in a few years. If you're setting up a holding company, that, uh, it's a great uh, place for a dividend to go. Is it caught by CFC rules that brings it into a 30% rate? You need to know that before you set up a structure like that. Yeah? So the existence of CFC rules is, is really important. Um, and that, that's a big one that could easily be overlooked. Um, loads of jurisdictions, all the ones listed here, in fact, loads of them exempt disposals of shares. They're actually subject to local rules, remember, as well, and they vary. So this table does not give you the answer. If you're advising on this for a client, this would not, it wouldn't be any good to put that up. You need to look at when that exemption applies in Cyprus and when that exemption applies in the UK. For example, the exemption applies in the UK under the substantial shareholdings exemption where you've owned the shares for a year. 
So if for whatever reason you weren't going to own the shares for a year, and yeah, that, okay, that is common. There's, a, there's an echo of that pretty much throughout uh, most jurisdictions' tax systems, but not always. So actually checking what the rules actually say. So it's not just simply a case of throwing up a table like that that says exempt. When's it exempt? When isn't it exempt? When do you actually breach that? Makes sense, yeah? <coughs> Bear with me. Hey. There are other things to consider, and these are things we haven't put down on the list there, but uh, these, these slides will all be coming over to you, so we will combine them with my multicolored photo to mean that you have quite a good list of different things that you need to consider. If you're going to be employing people there, how are they going to be taxed? Um, you can have situations where you get very high employment taxes in some jurisdictions. We'll look at some comparisons later on in the course, and jurisdictions vary a lot. Uh, there are some high European ones like France, uh, but there are, there are some, some elsewhere in the world, like I think Chile is, is unbelievably high. Um, so you may end up with employment taxes that you don't even think of at a corporate level. But actually there are costs to the business that mean that having the holding company there just doesn't make any sense. What about VAT? What about customs duties? What about things like aggregates tax in the UK? These indirect taxes that may affect the business, you need to be aware of those as well. We covered that corporate uh, rate. We covered uh, transfer pricing, and we mentioned um, we mentioned withholding taxes. Now, strictly, this is looking at the holding company, and then looking at the considerations for Scott, sorry, beg your pardon. Considerations for looking at a, 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 an operating company. So we're thinking in terms of holding company first, then operating company. All of these apply to either. Uh, okay, we're not going to be paying a dividend from the holding company. We're going to be getting a dividend paid into the holding company. But you still need to think about all of them in any jurisdiction, pretty much. Uh, they're all potential, uh, potential um, considerations. And the extent to which any is important does depend on the circumstances. Here's a little comparison of uh, some employee and employer, uh, sorry, employee tax rates that apply in these different countries. And this will be, it's a maximum, by the way. Employ Normally, does anyone here deal with employment taxes? Yeah, a couple of, uh, you'll, you'll know exactly what I mean. Normally, employment taxes, it's quite difficult for somebody, if somebody says, what's the rate of tax in your country? Well, hang on, uh, it all depends. And normally, there are different levels. Like in the UK, um, if I ever really want to send my mates to sleep and they ask me about how employees are taxed, I tell them, well, there's, there's income tax, obviously, then there's employers, national insurance, then there's employees, national insurance, and then there's tax deduction for the employers, national insurance, up to da 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 da, da on you go. It's really quite complicated when you look at the effective rate of an employment tax on any entity. So that is not an easy question. And again, that slide does not give you the answer. It's an indication. And you need to, in any case, work out what that is. The only way to do that is local advice. You need to get a local firm on the ground who can tell you how, how employees, employees are going to be taxed, how the company is going to be taxed on having employees. By the way, what else does, what, what does, um, what are the considerations do you have if you have employees, if you're going to have employees in your operating company? Assume it's the operating company has employees. What are the considerations have you got? A very good answer, yeah, yeah. So do you have an obligation to pay pension? You would in the UK. Uh, there's, not, there's a limited obligation for pretty much any employer to make pension provision for its employees in the UK. What else have we got? Like, so, so. Uh, and as I say, sort of uh, employee rights and any sort of, sort of legislation around yep. contracts and things for employees. Yeah, absolutely. And really scary stuff. Employee rights, um, the, the, you know, employees are increasingly in certainly in Western European economies are increasingly powerful. Um, the employment rights are quite strong now I'd say compared to how they would have appeared in the 70s and 80s and not half a bad thing either. Uh, but generally it's quite um, em employees do carry a lot of a lot of weight and you, you when you take employees on it's a big decision. Well, so there was another sh uh, in Yeah well, uh, absolutely well you might, you might be thinking about, are you thinking about national insurance or are you thinking about, are you thinking about insuring um, the, the business insurance, the, uh, making sure if any harm comes to them? Kind of, yeah, so legal, you have a legal liability to your employees. So things like health and safety standards, um, all those things in local jurisdictions need to be respected. And that's, that, okay, you, you, it's a simple answer. That isn't easy, but you need local expertise. You know, but you need the right local experts to come along and do that. 
Make sense? Yeah? So the point is, what I'm really trying to say is, do you remember earlier, it's dead easy, wasn't it? Uh, you know, we just, we don't want to pay effective rate of 66. No worries. Bung in your Dutch company, you're sorted, 20% rate. Well, kind of, but it's not that easy because all these things are considerations. And when you're advising anybody on this, or even, you know, when you're opening a conversation with somebody about this, these are all things we need to be thinking about. Oh. Right. Excellent. Aha! And as luck would have it, um, there's a way that you can access basic information on how different countries' tax regimes work. And I would stress basic information. I'm not saying Baker Tilly International are basic, Baker Tilly International are brilliant. Um, but that's where you go as a starting point. Where you go for the definitive answer is in somebody local. You get a local tax expert to sign off on these things. And actually building a network of people that do, uh, after this course, by the way, keeping contact with each other, building a network of people who are able to answer questions easily is really powerful. Okay, everyone happy with that so far? Okay, right, okay. Ooh. Uh, we mentioned residency, residence, residency, residence. Um, the, the normal, the normal n noun is residence in the UK, but residency, you will see people say, so don't worry about it. Um, uh, what we're looking at next is significant for the concept of where a company is resident. And um, basically, this is the concept of effective management and central management and control. And where this comes up in the double tax treaty is where you have different things pointing to residents in different countries. Or to be accurate, you have things that point to residents in both countries. So you have a situation where, under the domestic laws of two countries, you could have a company that's resident there and at the same time resident there. What do you do? Who actually wins that tug of love? And under the model OECD agreement, we'll talk about tax treaties some more, we'll talk about the model uh, um, organisa organisation for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, OECD, under the model OECD treaty, which is what most tax treaties follow. Where you've got a, a company that's in two countries, it's basically only going to be resident. The tiebreaker is where the effective management and control is, the effective management. Okay, everyone happy with that? Okay. In Saudi, the definition is companies incorporated under Saudi law are resident in Saudi. That's actually the same in the UK as well. If you incorporate, it didn't used to be until about, I think it was 96, 97. Uh, they changed the law then. Prior to that, you could have a company incorporated in the UK and it might not be resident. It was where its central management and control was. Now, if it's incorporated in the UK, it's automatically resident in the UK. And the same goes to Saudi. And, and companies where the effective management and control is in Saudi. So in other words, you incorporate the company under Saudi law, bingo, it's Saudi resident, or even if you incorporate it somewhere else, maybe hoping it isn't resident in Saudi, where it's effectively managed and controlled in Saudi, it's still there. Anybody want to, you've got a clue on the slide, how would anybody describe what's meant by effective management and control without reading the slide? In fact, I'll flick back so you don't. How would you define, it, define effective management and control? Anybody still got the energy to offer me a definition? I can see where this one's going. Okay. Um, it's kind of phrased differently depending on, depending on who you ask. But the way, the term that's often used under UK tax laws, it's where the, where the head is. It's where the the brain of the organisation is, where the key decisions are made. And it's a fine line, actually, because it's different from where the business is kind of day-to-day -day run. So the operation of the business might be in one place, but those big decisions that really decide what kind of business it is, where it is going strategically, what's happening with it, what it does, those kind of things, not what it does operationally in terms of which particular customer it goes to or which particular supplier it uses, but the big things about whether or not it, I don't know, diversifies into different areas, whether or not it 
stops undertaking a particular trade, whether or not it demerges into two separate groups. Where those decisions are made, that's where it's effective management and control is. Um, they used to say where the head and uh, the, the kind of head and I keep I keep wanting to say head and shoulders, which is a dandruff shampoo in the UK. Uh, so I don't mean that. It's where the head of the organisation is. It's where the decisions are actually made. And it says here for further reading, I recommend David Goldberg's article. I did not write the slide, so I didn't recommend David Goldberg's article, but uh, we do recommend David Goldberg's article. Um, so please, there is a good article on this, which is available at that link. Uh, that link, uh, you sh if you just if you just um, copy and paste it from the from the electronic version of the art of the slides that we're sending over, you should be able to find that, and that will give you a good flavour for what management and control really means in this context. It's key to working out where a company is really resident. Okay. Now, the next one is a bit of a tightrope, and this is to do with substance. Can you remember the situation we had with the Dutch company? We wanted something that was real, and we wanted to make sure that the dividend going to the Dutch company was real. But we don't necessarily want to create, well, the Dutch company is not the best example, actually, because there we did have a resident. But we don't necessarily want to create a permanent establishment in another company or allow the entity to be managed and controlled in the other company, in the other country. So we're on about the operating company. We've got a holding company. We've got an operating company beneath that. And that's going to be an operation that takes place in a particular jurisdiction. We want it to have substance. We want it to be real. But we don't want that to become a permanent establishment or an entity that's separately taxable in that country. Can you see the tightrope that we're treading there? Can you see that that's actually quite difficult to do? So what is substance? What do we mean by substance? And you know, I mean, these are logical things, but it's quite difficult if you're wanting to give an entity substance, but you don't want it to be a permanent establishment or an entity fully taxable in the other jurisdiction. You've got to tread a tightrope. And this is, like I said, this is quite hard. There's something being there. And I mean, physical substance is, um, yeah, you know, if you've got an office there, fine. If you've got an office there, you've almost certainly got a PE there. Uh, but having an office there, having some kind of physical presence there, having somebody there that does something for the company is going to make a difference. And that's distinct from that concept I used earlier on. Do you remember a letterbox company? Yeah. So, or a brass plaque company is the other one because, you know, you have companies, you have companies in Mauritius or companies in the BVI, and they have a big plaque outside. This is the registered office of the following companies. You know, uh, none of them have ever been there, um, but they just pay a fee every every year, and it goes to this Mauritius or this BVI company, this BVI entity uh, that registers that as their as their um, as their principal office. And so that is their office. That's their registered office, but it doesn't do anything. So something beyond that brass plaque, that letterbox company, physically in the the jurisdiction is going to help towards the being substance. Um, what that means, operational economic substance, again, uh, that's, I mean, the best example of that is, like I say, you could have somebody who is not an employee, but somebody who is actually doing work for the company as an agent or a commissionaire, which is a term I'll use tomorrow when I'm talking about a particular arrangement that BEPS looks to tackle. But somebody working as a commission on a commission arrangement for the principal company, that might give you some substance. Um, and um, something, if you, if, you got some, if you are happy to have tax residency in the state, then you almost certainly do have substance, or you're much more likely to have substance. If you're trying to avoid tax residency, then that's quite hard. Like I say, you are really treading a, treading a tightrope. Um, a big one is, and this is going to become increasingly a flavour within legislation that's intended to block the kind of planning I'm talking about, is beneficial ownership of income. And again, we'll use the Dutch company example. Do you remember in the Dutch company example, we had a three tier, we inserted the Dutch company as an intermediary company, we paid a dividend to the Dutch company, and it paid it straight up. If you owned the Dutch company, if you were running the Dutch company, do you think you, do you ever feel like you owned that money? Do you ever feel like that was yours? Was it really the beneficial income of the Dutch company? Well, if, it's, if it just had a standing order from its boss, the holding company, just a penny cash it gets straight on up, then almost certainly not. It almost certainly didn't have beneficial ownership. And that's going to be a test that's going to be increasingly applied. 
does the entity really have beneficial ownership of what it can what it receives beneficial ownership meaning it can do it can make a decision about doing something with it it can invest it it can lose it in other words it can invest it at risk so it can take a decision with that money and maybe it won't get it back or maybe it won't get such a great interest rate on it as its parent company would get so beneficial ownership actually really looking like someone who owns the stuff is going to be a big factor uh, but these two are the this this is these these are the killers, or the complete getting you home and dry arrangements. Keep saying it, but if you can have a commercial rationale for having the entity there, it doesn't need to be the only commercial rationale. You don't need to pretend you haven't got a tax motive. That's fine. There can be a tax motive, but having a commercial rationale, a real one, that you can show increases the value of the business and helps the value of the business is going to be really helpful. And the same as business, the business purpose is the same. And by the way, this comes back to the principal purpose test. I just want to, uh, because I often get people thinking, well, hang on, who are you kidding? Who are you kidding? If you're setting up this operating company in a low tax jurisdiction, and you're saying the main purpose is because actually the business runs better from there, that's not the main purpose. Tax is the main purpose. Come on, who are you kidding? Yeah? I often get people thinking that way. But remember, tax is only ever a rate. So if your business is going to earn 100, and it's more likely to earn 100 by being based in this particular jurisdiction because it commercially works better, and there's a very slim line in business between earning 100 and earning nothing, if it's more likely to earn 100, then that's bound to be the principal purpose, isn't it? Because the tax rate of 40 is only ever a rate of 100. So actually, that's not a silly argument. And just having a commercial benefit that shows that the business works better in that jurisdiction and is more likely to earn its 100 than in a, another jurisdiction is, I think, strong enough to mean that you'll be resistant to any likely attack. When we're talking about substance, um, we've touched on this a lot. And I'm, to some extent, going over old ground. A lot of this is common sense. Uh, we've mentioned this point already, you know, do you have an office somewhere that really is an office? Do you have some people there? And it is what the legislation, what the tax law of countries as it evolves over the coming years will be interested in. It's not what you say it is, not what the legal form is. It's not which entity you have chosen, where's it gone? We have different entities. It's not which entity you've chosen. It's actually what the reality of it is, what it's really doing. And I think, I think really, we're just operating in a, just a word of caution, we're operating in a world now, um, and as a UK tax advisor, I find this a lot, we're operating in a world now where there is paranoia about the power of taxing authorities to raise more tax. There is also a general climate in which the pub public opinion is against anything that is perceived tax avoidance or getting an, adv an advantage from tax, or from the tax system. And... What's happened is these things come in waves and because in terms of the tax authorities are at the crest of a wave, you have advisors really trying to talk themselves into a problem. I see this a lot where people think we're getting an advantage, therefore it can't be any good, it can't work. That isn't right. That isn't right. Just as it's too simple to say this rate of tax is unfair. That's too simple. Might be. Depends on perspective and depends on what you're talking about. There's no, I don't know that any rate of tax is necessarily fair. It all depends on the circumstances. It all depends on the detail. And this is similar. You may well have an arrangement that at first look only has a small commercial benefit, but actually viewed properly, that can easily be enough to mean it's properly justifiable um, as a benefit that justifies you getting the tax advantage. Uh, it's partly to do with the, it's partly to do with the, the climate we're in, and the climate we're in just means that we really do have to focus on the commercial rationale for anything that we're doing. Right. This is an important thing. We touched on this already, but I just want to elaborate on this a little bit because it is actually important. We've still got time to do it. Um, we talked about getting withholding tax on dividends, and we talked about where somebody receives a dividend, they're taxed in a particular way. We talked about getting a deduction for an interest payment, and we talked about getting a withholding tax on an interest payment. Absolutely fine. But remember that Dutch company example. 
Is it really a dividend received by the Dutch company? And if it isn't, is it a dividend really received by the Dutch company's parent? Because if it's a dividend received by the Dutch company's parent, we're looking at a different withholding tax rate, aren't we? Because they're in a different jurisdiction. So the reality of that is important. And that will largely be determined as time goes on by whether or not the Dutch company, in our example, the middle company, or it could be lots of other circumstances, but I'm just asking you to think, remind, remember that one, just for the purpose of this. Does that middle company actually become the beneficial owner of that income? Um, and this is in, in appearing increasingly in tax treaties, and it will be the key way in which a lot of these arrangements are challenged if, to the extent that they are challenged. And this really is the best way that we can summarise what beneficial ownership means in this context. Certainly, it means that the entity must become the legal owner of the money. Well, fine. We paid a dividend to Holland, didn't we? It's the legal owner. It's the legal owner. Um, you can prove that. You've got the dividend voucher. You've got the minutes declaring the dividend. You've got the register of shareholders showing who's going to receive the dividend. What's not to like? It's obviously the legal owner. I think that's pretty clear. But to be the beneficial owner, it's got to be these factors as well. And I em emphasise that word. It's got to be a degree of, there's got to be some possibility for there being economic risk. When I've got money in my bank account, the bank it's with could go bust, couldn't it? I mean, I think I'm taking a risk, and obviously money in the bank is the worst example because that's the safest thing there is, um, ish. Um, so, but I'm taking some risk with that, aren't I? If that bank goes down, that's my money gone. Yeah? Everyone see that, yeah? Okay. If money goes legally into the bank account of a company where we want it to be a dividend received by that company, there should be some possibility that that company, however remote, there should be some possibility that that company could lose it. That's the way to think about it. And it, it, like I said, it may be remote. But if it goes in in the morning and goes out in the afternoon, is there any risk of it losing it? No. Well, OK, uh, remote, but you're on about so remote, it's vanishingly small. If it sits there and that company has the right to use it and they're not governed in how they can use that, the, the management of that company can say, right, how do we invest this money? What do we do with it while it's in our ownership? If they can do that, then you've probably got beneficial ownership. Everyone see that? Contrast, example one, the money comes in and just by an automatic bank reaction, transfer it goes straight up to the parent. And then the legal paperwork to substantiate that follows. There's like a, 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 there's a, there's a minute and, uh, and uh, you know, a, um, uh, a dividend voucher and everything else. Example one. Example two, it comes into the company. The finance director of the company ensures that it is banked, sits down with his colleagues and decides what's going to happen with that money in the, for the next six months. Uh, employees, treasury experts, to make sure that that can be invested on short and medium term deposits to mean that they can get a good return on the money. Possibly takes a bit of gamble with a little bit of the money. Then after six months, declares a dividend up to the top company. Very different, aren't they? And in the second example, in theory, the money could have disappeared down a, down a hole. That's, take, that's beneficial ownership of it. And so, like I say, back-to-back -back transactions, coming in the morning, going out in the afternoon, all automated, very unlikely to be, very unlikely to be beneficial ownership that resides with whoever receives that. Uh, where, on the other hand, uh, so yeah, so if you've got, if you've already, if you're already committed to paying that on, which would be, you know, that Dutch example, historically, that would have been the situation. You would have had a situation where the money just hits the company and that company is told it's got to pay it out by way of dividend that day. And that's all that happens. That's not really going to work in the future. So these are the points. It's possession, it's no restriction of use, so you can go and invest it how you want. It's there being some risk. Uh, I said however remote, I mean, you know, there's always some risk, it's credited to your bank account, in theory the bank could go bust in the minute that it's sitting in your bank account. Real risk, you know, it's got to sit there for a period. Uh, is that a week, is that a day, don't know. Uh, but there's got to be something you can point to as a genuine risk of losing that money. And it can't be automated. Um, 
I think you've got to have a situation where the company receiving the money is actually making a decision about what it's going to do with it, whether that's to invest it or whether that's to pay it up to the parent. Oh my God, there's an awful lot of words on this slide, aren't there? Uh, shall I read them all? No. Um, and this is, the, um, th this is how the BEPS response is taking place to this. Um, and what they're wanting to do is, with a view to developing global common standard and the interlinking of national registers, uh, it's, uh, in, in line with all the BEPS measures that we're talking about, the whole point about BEPS is countries all doing the same thing and communicating with each other about it, which is all that's saying. It should be clear to all countries and tax jurisdictions that the world is moving firmly in the direction of greater tax transparency. Well, fine. Uh, that was our Chancellor, as he was at the time, making that comment. Uh, the point really coming from this is that the push in terms of international direction, in terms of, in terms of different countries legislating on this, is that they will all take that common approach at some point that these are the tests of whether or not somebody has genuine uh, economic uh, beneficial ownership or something. And unless they do, you don't get the withholding tax rates that apply to it. Uh, that'll be it. And countries will be sharing with each other the information to make sure that's, that they can check on that. So, you know, if we're paying up dividends and just not withholding any tax, but they don't know where they're going, uh, then the registers will indicate they are going into Holland and they can have a look at Holland to see whether or not that company is actually taking, uh, taking beneficial ownership. Another thing we need to be aware of, and do you remember this, we're still really talking about all the things we need to consider when we're talking about setting up a, an arrangement, is CFC rules. I, I won't say too much about these, um, a CF, but we've already touched on these to some extent. The CFC rules, as we know, are to stop uh, a country, stop a business, stop an entity benefiting from lower tax rates in another company, another country, simply by creating a subsidiary, pushing down the business into that subsidiary or some element of it, having that tax in the subsidiary in that lower tax regime, and that's the end of it. And all they do, all these rules do, is broadly they say that where you've got that arrangement, and normally you're outside certain safeguards, where you've got that arrangement, then the host company, the top company, the top country, sorry, the host country, so the top company in the high tax regime, that's taxed on all the profits of the CFC, just as if they were theirs. Yeah, we've, we've kind of covered that earlier on. And um, I mean, this is what this says. Um, there are different rules in different countries. Lots of countries have, have CFC legislation, there we go. Too many words on this slide, I'm afraid, but this is for reference when you get back home and you print off the slides and you read them all again tonight, um, then, um, then these, these will be there for reference. All these countries have CFC legislation. That's the direction of travel. More and more countries will have CFC legislation. It's only common sense because it's like the easiest bit of avoidance, really. You just bung stuff down into a subsidiary company in a low tax regime, bingo, uh, you'd be sorted. So you can't really have that. And so, you know, given that, I think it's only logical that you've got more and more countries um, introducing these rules. Uh, typically, they work, um, I mean, there's some basic things that you need to have in place for a CFC regime to work. So what you've got to have is, um, I mean, they're not, they're not, these, are, these are individual countries' rules. And the way they will work is, take the UK, they apply where you've got a subsidiary that is obviously resident in another country. It doesn't, there's no point, that's, that's what it's trying to tackle. It is controlled by persons resident in the other country, uh, sorry, in, in, the, in the UK in my example. And being in that other territory, it's subject to a lower rate of tax. And different rules will apply in different ways. So there'll be a percentage normally, it will be like in the UK, it's got to be, it's quite, quite, a, quite a low threshold, quite a, um, an easy threshold to fall within actually. If the tax rate you're suffering in the destination country is less than 75% of the UK rate, and then you can be within the rules. That's typically how these rules will work in, in, most, in most jurisdictions. And where you are setting up something and there are CFC rules and you have to worry about the CFC rules, obviously if they apply and they just mean that the operating company that you're hoping to work just doesn't work because basically the profit's all gonna be taxed in the country that you started off with and at a higher tax rate, then fine. Uh, you've got, then there's not much point doing it, but um, even if you're happy that you're outside the effect of the CFC rules in a particular jurisdiction, you still have to worry about them. Because if nothing else, they will, um, they will apply a, um, uh, they will apply 
an, an, an additional compliance burden on the company that's, that holds the shares in the company that could be a CFC. So proving and being in a position to prove that it's not a CFC or that the profits of that, CFC, of that, of that subsidiary are not taxable under these rules is a job for the holding company. And that's something you have to worry about and that's something that you have to work at. Um, bizarrely, um, the rules in the UK were changed a few years ago. It was uh, 2013, I think, they got changed. Have uh, we got that right? 2013? Um, was, was it 14? 13. When the rules in the UK were changed, they actually did something quite odd. They introduced a lot of exemptions. Um, and there's normally exemptions in CFC rules. So if you've got a subsidiary company and it's carrying on a genuine trade, then fine, it might be benefiting from a low rate of tax, but that's fine. Still, it's carrying on a genuine trade. Uh, but there's actually one for a finance company in the UK. So if you've got a subsidiary that's carrying on a finance function, there's an exemption from the CFC rules and that, which is really generous and a bit of a surprise. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, well, to be accurate, there's a, there's a very low rate of tax that applies, but it's, it's largely defended from the CFC rules. So let's just have a quick look at an example. OK. Um, we've got this example here. We've got a UK company. Oh, there you go. It owns 100% of the shares in an Irish company, okay? And the UK corporation tax rate, well, I'm afraid this is out of date, it's actually 19% now, but 19% is much harder to work with than 20%, so shall we just pretend it's 20%? Thank you. Um, and the rate in Ireland, I think, is still 12.5, so I think that's what we've got, okay? Would the CFC rules apply there? Yeah, potentially they would, because... My mental arithmetic isn't what it should be. But you can see that that is less than 75% of that rate. Yeah? Because that is less than 75% as that. You're in the front door and you've got a potential problem. Um, by the way, this would have been laughable a few years ago. The idea that you'd have an Irish subsidiary and that would be caught within the CFC rules is quite, would have been quite comical 15, 20 years ago. Um, but that's, that's the way the world has gone. And Ireland is pretty much a, a corporate tax haven to a large extent now. Um, so you're in the front door of the rules, so then you'd have to decide whether you were saved by any of the exemptions. And the main one would be, if that's carrying on a genuine trading activity in Ireland, so that's just, you know, got proper substance in Ireland it's tra and it's trading in Ireland and carrying on a genuine business that you can see as a genuine business, then that wouldn't fall within the CFC rules. And instead, we'd just be taxed on the dividends that are paid up. If, on the other hand, it's not within one of the exemptions, then it's straight back in the UK and you're taxed in the UK. Not much point bothering setting up your Irish company. So working out whether or not or to the extent that the CFC rules can apply, it's obviously an important point. What I think we're really saying is, right at the start, I asked you to think about the considerations if you were setting up a structure involving a parent company and a subsidiary. And I appreciate this is a bit of a, you know, it's a, just a very open kind of example. Um, but given that this is an introduction to the topic, we think it's sensible to keep it as an open example. Um, the, you've just got to really think that there are lots of things to think about. And there are lots of, things, lots of boxes we need to tick to have any chance of this achieving the tax effect that we want. And we started off early on saying, well, it's dead easy, isn't it? Look at that, you get a different withholding tax. If it's on dividends, you get a different withholding tax. In this jurisdiction, you get a different withholding tax. Or you get a, a corporate deduction in the, in the, in the, uh, the company carrying on the trade uh, if, it's, if it's this arrangement. All very, very simple. These are really the things you need to think about to make any of those effective. And that's the difference between having something that in theory works. Um, it's dead easy, this job, by the way. I can just tell you stuff that in theory works and don't have to come up with an actual answer. This is what I have to go back to my desk and in my day job work out if it really works to come up with something that really works. You need to think about where any of the entities involved in this are really resident, and that's down to where they're effectively managed and controlled. You've got to think about whether any of the entities involved in it have sufficient substance to mean that they really exist and the thing that you are saying they are doing in paying a dividend or receiving interest or charging interest really can be taken into account for tax. But in ensuring they've got the right substance, if you don't want them to be a PE, you need to make sure they stay clear of that, stay the right side of that line. Big one and an easy one to understand in many ways and therefore one that politicians will love is making sure that you can prove beneficial ownership of any entity in the structure where you are lying on being able to say that that entity received a certain thing. If you need to be able to say to somebody that this company received a dividend, 
you better be sure that that company had beneficial ownership of the dividend that it received and the CFC rules. But it's ultimately that. Do we have a commercial rationale for doing it? And I'll repeat what I said. Commercial rationale doesn't mean you haven't thought about tax. It doesn't mean that there isn't a tax advantage. It doesn't mean that there isn't a big tax advantage. It means that as well as that, there is a commercial rationale that means the business operates better by having that structure compared to not having it. That's what it will all turn on. Okay, I've talked too much, as always. So here's a quick quiz for you guys. So I need some answers, and real fast, so I can have you away uh, nice and early. Um, it's quite simple, but just um, this is on the question of beneficial ownership. I just want you to imagine three scenarios. I just want you to, when we've been through them all, uh, you can shout out uh, which ones you think are an example where we have beneficial ownership and which ones aren't. I'm afraid these aren't phrased very well, so I'll just decipher. First one is, if a company pays all dividends immediately through to its parent without, uh, without risk or control and undertakes no active management, is it the beneficial owner? What I'm on about there is, imagine our Dutch company, the dividends are on about the dividends it receives. If it does back-to-back -back pays them straight out to the parent, that's scenario one. Scenario two, if a company pays interest, this interest it receives immediately through to its parent at a lower interest rate, is it the beneficial owner? And the third one is if a company receives royalties from 30 countries across the world, pays one amount to its parent, and at a later date, after receiving a margin, um, is it the beneficial owner? So what do we think? Remember this point about beneficial ownership? Remember, it's really important that the company that's receiving the dividend, the interest, the royalties, and then paying it on, it's really important to get the right withholding tax rate that they really are the beneficial owner of it. Otherwise, that isn't a royalty payment, it isn't a dividend, it isn't an interest payment, certainly not to that company. So what do we think? What do we think about the first one? No, no anyone think you do have beneficial ownership there? No, I, I love it when people try to defend the indefensible. Yeah, of course, right, there is no beneficial ownership there. That's exactly the kind of thing that we're scared of now. If you get a back-to-back -back payment into the company, out of the company, forget it. What about that one? We have a yes, beneficial ownership? Better. Better. <laughs> I, I think probably not. You think probably not, OK. Can it be the beneficial owner of part of the interest? Uh, you could be, yeah, you could be. That's, that's a possibility. Any other thoughts? Sorry? Uh, yeah, true, yeah. Um, uh, I'll tell you what the model answer says. The model answer says maybe. Um, <laughs> fat lot of you, isn't it? Uh, someone pays me for this, can you believe it? Um, the, uh, yeah, you know, it depends. And um, the point is there, that, that is on the borderline. There's a factor which is good, but it's probably unlikely. I think you'd either get a ruling that it is or it isn't. Um, it's quite, you, you might get a situation where they say, well, actually, some of that, you, you ben, we'll treat some of that as a dividend. But I don't think that's the way the courts would normally go. They'd either just say it is or it isn't. I may be wrong, but, uh, but I, think, I think it would. Uh, but is it or isn't it? And we don't know. No good. Um, the, uh, the thing that's not so great is it pays it immediately. <coughs> now, it almost certainly takes legal ownership of it. It must do, because it's gone into its bank account. Otherwise, how does it pay it out? So I think you take legal ownership, that'd be fine. Paying immediately, well, um, has it got any risk? Well, I think it depends on how it's decided this low interest rate. Because if what it can do is it's open to it to sort of say what interest rate it pays, and its parent may go, hey, what are you doing? Uh, where's the rest of it? And they say, no, this is ours, we're keeping that, we want a margin. Then I think that actually is a good indication of beneficial ownership, because you're earning something from it. OK, um, I think if it's too artificial, if, I, if uh, taxing authorities can prove that's just how you set it up to circum circumvent these rules, then I think you'd fail. But if you genuinely did it so that it's back to back, but the company was taking a profit and you wanted it to take a profit, then I think you'd be all right, personally. Uh, but it's not clear. It's not certain. What about the last one? What do we think? The company receives royalties from 30, so what about the company that receives the royalties? The company receives royalties from 30 countries across the world, and it pays one amount to its parent, but at a later date, and after taking a margin, what do you reckon? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'd say so. 
I'd say so. Uh, it's the later date that's really conclusive, I think, here, because not only has it legally received the money, it's sat on it. And remember, whenever you're sitting on money, you're running a risk. Something could happen. Um, OK, there's no, there's no kind, there's nothing in any of the guidance or the legislation that says the degree of risk. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to go down the casino and put it on 13 black. Um, you know, you're just be, you're taking some risk just by sitting on it because that the bank that it's with could fail. Uh, now, if that's overnight, is that really a risk? If same day, but if you're sitting on it for a period of time, I think that's very helpful. And the fact that it actually makes a margin on it again is helpful. Um, you, at some point, there will be cases that will determine how long we feel you can sit on that money. Um, and you know. A couple of years from now, I might be standing in front of you and saying, make sure you leave it in the bank account for a year. Make sure you leave it in the bank account for six months. At the moment, there's no guidance. We don't know. Uh, but I think uh, having it for a period and having a risk of losing it is the key thing. Oops. OK, great. So I'm just going to talk to a couple of examples on um, of cross-border intellectual planning. Uh, intellectual property planning. So we've got this situation. Uh, we've got a situation where we've got a company in Saudi uh, which is operating through a subsidiary, so it's 100% owner, and it's got 2,000 of equity. And what we're doing is this time we're doing some planning which is involving finance cost. And this is what we looked at before. Instead of there being equity, we're going to have a thousand pounds of debt and only a thousand pounds of equity. Thousand pounds, a thousand could be ten million, hundred million, whatever your number is. Uh, so we've got we're splitting the equity into both equity and debt. Okay, they're the two alternative things. So they're the two options. Let's have a look at how they work out. This is just a recap of what we looked at before. Um, where you've got interest that's being paid from the U.S. into the into the uh, into the Saudi company, you've got a deduction for uh, it should say interest. Apologies, you've got a deduction there for that interest. So you're taking out the tax rate in the US, and instead what you've got is you've got, um, you've got a withholding tax on the payment of the interest, should say interest again, not fees. You've got a withholding tax on the payment of the interest, and you've got a corporate rate in Saudi, which is, brings us down to that effective rate. We talked about the situation where you introduce a treasury company. So you've got the Saudi company there that owns 100% of the Dutch company, that owns 100% of the US company. By, and we went through this before, by paying interest instead of the dividend, then we're getting down to that 20% tax rate. Everyone remember that, yeah? This is where we have to worry about BEPS Action 4, OK? Um, because that is an absolute fine arrangement in principle. And in theory, that works great. And that can, that can be something that people can use and can be something that we use to get that advantage. advantage. But this has been identified already. Now, like I said, there's already legislation that's there intended to stop us exploiting that anyway. You've got transfer pricing legislation, you've got thin capitalization legislation. So you've already got something that's intended to stop you kind of bending the rules too far to get advantage of this. But um, the BEPS Action 4 is intended to go further. And it's intended to encourage countries to introduce a maximum deduction. We've already touched on this, so it's repetition. Introduce a maximum deduction that any country can, that any company can have. And this is intended to be a percentage of its earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization, or EBITDA, very broadly, your pre-tax profits. So it's supposed to be a maximum percentage of profits in the company. Yeah, everyone, everyone familiar with that? And it's actually, potentially, quite a high maximum percentage. It's, um, it's up to 30%. And that's what the UK proposed rule is intended to do, to introduce a 30% cap on the maximum deduction that you can get for the interest payment that you're making. So how's that changed this? We there got a deduction for interest there of 100, didn't we? That's 100% of the profits. Can't do that anymore. Now, I've not said that, that I said that's the net profit in the USA. I don't know whether that's the EBITDA or not. But if that were the EBITDA, then under those rules, that deduction would only be 30 is the maximum suggested by that, uh, that particular BEPS action. Might be as low as 10. So your maximum deduction might actually only be 10. And every country needs to introduce this law. UK, I think, are a bit ahead of the game. It's great that the UK are ahead of the game on 
stopping people doing tax planning. Um, the, um, uh, I, I guess in some ways it is. But the UK uh, proposed this rule um, in the last uh, budget and uh, after some consultation and the, the proposition was that that's 30%. Uh, that still isn't on statute, uh, unless I'm getting completely confused. It's not on statute yet, is it? Because it didn't go through in the finance bill. Sorry? Yeah, finance yeah thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I was saying that earlier on, I was thinking, God, am I getting that mixed up? But no, it's definitely... What happened was, I mentioned earlier on, we had this little election, um, which is a little political stunt in the UK. So we had an election and um, didn't quite go the way that most people were expecting. One effect of that election was the legislation we had lined up to re receive what's called the Royal Assent and become statute in the UK. So this is the election that had gone through our budget process and was going to become statute. That was lined up to go on statute books. It included this. And um, because the election came along, the finance bill went from being that long to about that long. And there were just these weird rules about uh, sort of about sugar tax, uh, basically, wasn't it? It was, it was soft drinks industry tax. All that went, lot went through. Uh, so this actually didn't make it on statute. So at the moment, this isn't on statute, but it almost certainly will go on statute, and I expect will be backdated to the budget when it was announced, uh, because that's normally how the, the statutory vote. That's normally how the leg legislative process in the UK works. So you can expect that to be there. Um, we've got, we have got this in the UK. You can, well, sorry, we will have it in the UK when, when this makes on statute. Um, on top of a restriction just on the EBITDA of a particular company in a particular jurisdiction, you can soften the rule a little bit. You can say, look, if you've got a big worldwide group and you just happen to have a big interest reduction in that country there, you can actually do it on a worldwide basis. So provided it's not more than a certain percentage of your worldwide EBITDA, then we're okay. And what that where that would help is if you need to have a treasury function in one particular, in respect to one particular subsidiary, you could still have it and it might not be affected by this cap, provided you've got enough EBITDA uh, around the world. Okay, so quick quiz for you. You've got to do some work again. I'm sorry, this is unfair, isn't it? There's only 15 minutes to go as well. Um, I thought you got away easy. Um, the, uh, just have a quick look at this and just tell me whether you think there is any restriction in that example. Assuming that rule that I talked about before, the 30% rule, assuming that's in law in the UK, imagine this situation. You've got income of 1,000, you've got costs of that, interest of that, depreciation of that, amortisation of that. So net profit before tax you've got is that. Do we think we've got any restriction under the rule I just described? Remember it's... E so yeah, bingo, fantastic. We have a winner. Uh, you've all been saved doing any work on this. Uh, we, do, we do actually have a restriction on it. And the reason we have a restriction is the EBITDA, that is not the EBITDA. The EBITDA that we've got is going to be that uh, minus that, so it's 250, okay? Uh, minus, uh, so, it's, it's actually, so it's actually 250. So 30% of 250 uh, is going to be the uh, maximum uh, that we can have. Um, so uh, that's uh, 75, isn't it? Um, so, uh, so 75 at 20%, it was using a 20% rate. It means that's actually 15% is, um, is the deduction that you're going to get uh, effectively on your, uh, the, 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 the interest, sorry, I beg your pardon, you're quite right. The interest deduction that you've got is on 25. So the interest deduction that you've got is on 25, uh, sorry, the interest deduction you've got is on 75. It's restricted by 25 in that example. Okay? It's clearly getting late in the day. Uh, but we do, we do have a restriction under those rules. So that's very simply put how those rules will work. Right. That was, we're talking about um, interest deduction there, and we're talking about a cap on that. Remember that it's not only interest deduction. Do you remember this example as well, where we were talking about royalties, and we were talking about um, how the royalties could get you down to uh, a lower tax rate if you do something, uh, if you do this. So there you've just got a payment of a dividend, but here you've got royalties with, for some reason, the S going onto a different line, which is annoying. Um, so where you've got a situation where a royalty payment is made up into the Saudi company instead of a dividend payment from the US, remember that brought us down to that effective rate. And where you introduced a Dutch company and you had the dividend going through, you had the, you had the royalty going through the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, Dutch company, uh, this should say royalty, by the way, because this is intellectual property we're talking about. You had the royalty going through the Dutch company, then that got you down to a rate of 20%. You all remember that, okay? 
Well, um, basically, that is also something that is vulnerable to attack under BEPS, as we know. And the big thing here, and this will be the last main thing I, I, I do with you before we go on to the, just looking at the case study very, very quickly. Um, the big thing here is what, what really all the countries involved in the BEPS process are unhappy about is there being a difference between the country where you get a deduction, the, the country that charges rather for the use of the IP, so the country to which you're making a payment for the use of the IP, and the development of that IP is when there's no link between those, uh, those regimes and there's not really been a fair tax charge on getting the goodwill or the intangible or the intellectual property, whatever it is, into that jurisdiction. The OECD nations, quite rightly, in my view, don't really like that. And this has been the stuff that's been in the headlines, isn't it? It's the use of Mongas companies, the use of BVI companies, the use of Panamanian companies um, as homes for the IP of very big multinationals. All the profit goes in there. What did that company ever do to develop the, uh, the IP? So the push will be towards um, basically giving, allowing relief for payments for IP, but where you can demonstrate that there's some good reason for that particular company that where the IP resides for it having the benefit of it. So if that developed it in the first place, if that was involved in the development or bought it for a perfectly good market value, then I think there that's going to be stronger. Where that isn't the case, that's going to be tougher. Um, and um, UK, yeah, I, I, keep, I keep bigging up the UK and saying we're ahead of the game on this, um, but th th there is some truth in that. Uh, they're already tougher laws in the UK on royalty payments in terms of the definition of what royalty payments actually apply to and how they apply. We're going to be covering a bit more on this tomorrow. Um, but there will be extra rules introduced, and you'll see this across the world, which are anti-abuse rules, which will be put into domestic law. And you'll see things a bit like the GAR, the general anti-abuse rule, that catch-all or general, general anti-avoidance rule, depending on which jurisdiction you're talking about. You'll see things like that appearing and applying to payments of royalties for the use of IP under double tax agreements. They'll be in domestic law. So really, um, what about today has been about this really. If you're looking, there are opportunities, there are things that can be done, there are ways in which we can still put together international structures, cross-border structures, which do achieve better results than what might otherwise be your starting point. You've all seen that, yeah? The basic thing, do you remember Saudi owning all of US, just getting a dividend payment, effective rate of tax, 66%. Oh, not good. And just by doing some relatively simple things, we were able to cure that, weren't we? Able to bring that right down to a 20%. In theory, that's still available. It's just harder. And it's all down to this. It's all down to having a commercial rationale. Can you actually have a commercial rationale for having entities in different jurisdictions. Um, and I think my answer to that is, yes, if you look hard enough. And I don't mean by that, just pretend you've got a commercial rationale, just get something down on paper, but make use of it. If you're setting up an arrangement which means that you do have a Dutch finance company, what else can you do for you? What can be the advantage of that finance company? I touched on this before. There is real expertise you can tap into there. If it helps you do your business, it means you do your business more effectively and makes it more likely that your business will succeed and makes it more likely that you will achieve what you want to achieve, then that is enough of a motive to mean that I think you have a commercial rationale. You don't have to have everything structured so you're paying the highest rates of tax in any jurisdiction. But having commerciality is what we now need. The days, if you ever could do this, and arguably you couldn't, the days of the kind of brass plaque company are gone. Okay. Everyone happy so far? It's moving all the time and stuff changes all the time. I got asked at the break um, over lunch what, what I thought, where I thought all this was going. I mean, I'm afraid it's a slightly pressing one, which is um, I think all of it will be overtaken by changes that none of us can imagine. 
I was just reminiscing uh, when um, when um, uh, one of my one of my Baker Tilly colleagues found out I could speak some Russian, and she wondered why. And it was because I used to be I did a degree in French and Russian, and was in Kiev, and I was explaining how there were no mobile phones, there was no internet. It wasn't that long, well, it was a long time ago, but it's 30 years ago, but blimey, the world is a different place, isn't it? Uh, and in 10 years, the world has changed uh, inconceivably to how it looked 10 years ago. The same will happen again in the next five to 10 years. The changes that we'll have in the way that we conduct business, the changes that we will have in the way uh, that we communicate with each other, the changes in which we have, the changes that will happen just in the way we live, will mean that, frankly, most of this stuff will be redundant before it's in place, if I'm brutally honest, uh, which is really bad because it means that you've been paying attention for no reason whatsoever. Uh, the, um, uh, don't say we knew that anyway. Um, the, uh, this clearly is current. This is what the situation is now. When you're speaking to clients, this is what you need to be aware of. I suspect before any of this actually gets to court, in a big way, it'll have moved on again in a way that none of us can imagine. But this is where we are at the moment. Everybody happy? Yeah? Great. Um, right, we've got 10 minutes left uh, to finish at the same time. Can you all have a quick five minute read of the case study? And then we're going to jot a few words down on, on a flip chart and then we're done. OK. We have five minutes to come up with some thoughts on this. And I'm not saying anything. I just want to know what your thoughts are on it. What are the considerations here? What kind of things are we thinking of? What's going through your minds? What do you think might be a possibility? We've got that company that's wanting to have a good, it's right, Saudi, this, is Saudi multi, uh, this is Saudi multinational. That's planning to buy a German business, Opco. The German company has an Irish subsidiary. The CFO plans to, it's the CFO of, of our company plans to finance the acquisition by way of loan, so we're going to be going on from borrowing from somewhere in order to, uh, to finance this, yeah? What, what are our thoughts? And you can stonewall it for five minutes because we're finishing then anyway, um, but uh, you wouldn't learn anything. So uh, anybody, any thoughts? Anybody brave enough to shout anything out? Yes, madam. Yep. As well as cheap seafood. Yep. And in addition, I would say that now that the holding company is having a Dutch company, yep. I would consider to set up a, a Dutch holding company in the Netherlands. Yep. And uh, because there's no CUC legislation in the Netherlands, um, can create substance and for the reasons of the Yep. So yes, I don't know if you can read that, if you can see that. So the Dutch company would be the holding company, the German operating company, the Opco. Yeah. Yeah. Or set up a separate holding company. Yep. Got you. So you create a separate group. Yeah, but of course, the company wishes about effective management, substance, and wealth. Yep, brilliant. I like it. Um, did everyone catch what was being said there? By the way, there isn't, there isn't a model answer here. There's no right or wrong. But that's certainly along the lines of the kind of thing that I think we'd be having in mind. What the other thought, what, what are the, what things, just, just look at the, Look at the, um, the description you've got in terms of your case study and l look at some of the details in that. Does anybody want to throw out any salient points from that, from that example? What are, the, what are the points that kind of grab you that you need to think about? Well, to start off with, what, what, about the, what about the actual corporate tax rates? What's the obvious point here? Yeah. yeah. It, it, as a tax planner, as somebody giving tax advice, you want to be thinking whether you can reduce that, don't you? Yeah? I mean, you know, being, having done tax for 30 years, that's what leaps off the page for me. 
Uh, now, okay, there are bigger considerations. So you've got to start with why, the, which is, madam, what you said at the back, you've got to start with a conversation about why, what you're trying to do, what you're trying to achieve, why you want to do it. But remember, a finance company, a finance function company is a perfectly normal commercial thing to have. They exist without any tax motive. Um, the fact that they also get you a big tax advantage is quite useful. Uh, but they do exist without any tax motive. So I think thinking in those lines. But that, that's one, isn't it? That's one. That tax rate there, that kind of leaps off the page. What else, what else leaps off the page? There's another high tax rate. Yeah. So you kind of look at this scenario. You start dead right. You start with a conversation about what we're trying to do, why we're trying to do it, what's good for you, what works in your daily life, where you're trying to get to, where do you want to be in 10 years' time, what's the end plan, what's the end game. Are you looking to sell it? Are you looking to find new investors? Are you looking whatever? You have those conversations, genuinely. You don't turn up with, here's the solution. Here's the solution, which is we have this, this, this company. But when you've had those conversations, which is exactly the suggestion from the back, uh, then you're thinking about in tailoring them these things leap off the page, don't they? What else leaps off the page, which is good? Tax rate in Ireland. Tax rate in Ireland, yeah. Tax rate in Ireland is very, very low. If we can find a way to get deductions here, but to leave the tax there, that will improve things. If we can find ways in which instead of paying dividends, that we are paying royalties or we're paying fees um, back into a high tax jurisdiction, then that, that will be, that'll be good because there's no withholding tax on them. So, so all of these things are the sort of salient points that you're identifying and that may give you a clue as to the right structure. There isn't a right structure. There isn't a right or wrong. The point, the, but they're the things to be sort of straight away ringing, highlighting, uh, and should be jumping off the page at you, uh, these different, different rates that can apply. So something with, I mean, your Dutch company, and that could be the holding company. I think you were saying the holding company with another subsidiary uh, yeah, there are several solutions. Yeah. Yeah, like you are saying, if the high percentage of div dividend is an angle, or the Germany uh, sin tax rate, yeah. then yeah, there are possibilities to set up a separate Dutch holding company yeah. or to make this Dutch uh, operating company a holding company. Well, yeah, there's, I can talk for hours. But. And that, well, that, that, is, that is the point. You could, there isn't, there isn't, uh, we're not, and we're not going to go any further than this today because the point is there isn't a simple solution. Uh, there are loads of solutions, and you could think of different solutions to make this, make this better. The point really is you start with what... what uh, every, uh, whenever I'm giving advice, and I'm teaching, I'm teaching, you know all this, and it's not my job really to tell you this. You know that when we're giving advice to people, it's not giving them a solution. It's finding out what they want. And where, what do they want? Where do they want to be? What do they want to achieve? What do they see as being the drivers? As the CEO of that company or the, or the CFO of that company, what's really important to him? Because the first thing he might say, that conversation may begin with, well, I don't want to, be, don't want to have any bad headlines about us. Thank you very much indeed. And then you would really caveat the use of any structure that is doing anything to reduce a marginal rate anywhere. Uh, because if somebody's worried about reputational risk, then you've got to be sensitive to that. So it's what do they actually want? Where do they want to be? And depending on what the short, medium, and long-term aims are, that changes it totally. Because it may be you never have to pay anything out of Ireland at all. Maybe everything can just sit in Ireland, and that can, uh, that can be where it stays. And you just get it building up at a corporate rate, and you sell Ireland. That might be the plan. Who knows? And if that is the plan, forget all the other stuff. So it's finding out what the commercial re rationale is, then coming up with all the different opportunities and the trigger for those opportunities it's easy in international tax in this respect the trigger for thinking about where those opportunities are are where you get the egregious rates where you get the ones that stick out it's where you get a zero or you get a 30 straight away you've got to be thinking well is there a way in which you can tackle that that ladies and gentlemen is all we have time for today